Well, good morning, everyone. I want to go ahead and convene us. I am Kelly Testy, the Dean of the University of Washington School of Law. It's my great pleasure, um, just a, a real true delight to be able to welcome you to the University of Washington, to William H. Gates Hall, and to the fourth annual Robotics Law and Policy Conference, We Robot. So welcome. Make yourselves at home here. Um, we're just so happy to have you. And if there's any way we can make your time with us more efficient, comfortable, that's what we're here for. And I hope you'll feel free to rove around the building and enjoy some of the, the art and uh, just, uh, just enjoy being here on campus in one of the most beautiful times of the year. This conference is just terrific and I'm so delighted we can host it because over the next two days you'll hear from top experts in the field about the best legal and policy infrastructure for robotics. And I really enjoyed already this morning meeting many of you and learning about what a truly interdisciplinary conversation this is. Um, that is a word we use all the time and we, we, we quest for interdisciplinarity, but many times it's harder to achieve than I wish it was. And it's just wonderful here to see that we really do have an interdisciplinary conversation, lawyers, engineers, computer science, scientists, philosophers, and, and many, many others. And this conversation that you'll have today, in part because of that interdisciplinarity, will also uh, have real impact. Uh, state legislatures, uh, federal agencies, and others are already looking to this community as they fashion rules that will govern driverless cars, drones, and other robotics. And for law students who are here today, and I certainly welcome you, we always try and put our students first here at UW Law, this is a really hot area. And I understand that law firms such as sponsor uh, Littler Mendelssohn have robotics practice groups today. One of our own alumni is the lawyer for Amazon's drone delivery program. Uh, so this is a really wonderful emerging area uh, for, for law students to consider. And I do want to just add my own thanks to all the sponsors of the conference today. Very grateful for that help. While you're on campus, as I said, get to know our law school. Our community is engaged in a variety of impressive and diverse work in many areas of law, um, as many times as we can, collaborating with partners across disciplines because we don't believe that any of our deepest problems of uh, complexity or justice will be solved by law alone. We know we must be in partnership with other fields to address those challenges. And uh, this is a place where ideas come from. Uh, our mission is to be leaders for the global common good in all areas of law and business and policy and places where those, those intersect. So I want to thank you in joining us in this discussion and being here for this conference. And now turn things over to my colleague, Professor Ryan Kahlo. Uh, I know he's well known to many of you. He's an assistant professor of law here, directs our tech policy lab. Uh, he's a co-director of that, again, an interdisciplinary effort with two other schools. And he's also one of our faculty directors of our law school's Center for Advanced Study and Research in Intellectual Property, uh, more commonly known as, as CASREP. Uh, I'm very proud to call Ryan Kahlo my colleague, a wonderful teacher, incredibly exciting thinker and scholar, and uh, just uh, looking forward to all the, uh, the conversations that you all engage in together. And Ryan, thank you for all you've done to bring this to UW Law. Hi, everybody. Wow, four years, fourth year of We Robot. It's crazy. Um, yeah. Um, whoa, what was that? That's the robots are concerned about how the games that we're making. What's going on with that? Uh, yeah? OK, cool. Good. Um, so uh, you know, I, 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 there's so many familiar faces. I, I know you guys know what this is all about. But I just thought it'd be worthwhile um, to say a few words kind of trying to sort out where we robot, at least in my own idiosyncratic view, and other people may have other views, where it sort of fits into the whole ecosystem. Um, because now that we're four years in, um, I had a great conversation with uh, um, uh, someone else on the program committee who's also the, the um, program chair in alternate years, uh, Michael Frimkin, about the fact that when you read the papers for We Robot this year, you get a real sense of, of, of momentum. You see that they're building on one another. It's not 
anymore that people are just taking a stab at whatever they find interesting in the space. There's a conversation unfolding. And that's one of the, and, and Michael observed that uh, to me last night, and I, I have to say I completely agree with that. Um, but to position us of, of where we are, I mean, you know, robotics law uh, is, uh, is a pretty specific thing, I think, as we conceive of it. And we're not meaning to be in any way exclusive, but at the same time, we should recognize that we're having a particular kind of conversation. Or at least, again, this is my own view. Um, there are people and there are conferences that talk about things like the way that artificial intelligence will change how we practice law. The application of artificial intelligence, for instance, you know, robot lawyers, in other words. And there's a whole conversation going on around that. There's a very sophisticated and even longer conversation, um, really dating back years and years now, um, which in some cases touches upon the law, but is distinct, which is that about robot ethics, right? Um, and these are and our participants uh, at the highest level, uh, like my colleague uh, Mike Bendelus, you know, and, and Peter Asaro and others, also participate in this conference. But a discussion of robot ethics is also somewhat distinct. And so as I, as I conceive of this conversation, and again, you know, I don't claim any particular ownership over it, and you should, you should develop whatever views you want, but as I conceive of it, this is really about, uh, as Kelly said, as, as Dean Testy said, uh, fashioning the proper, uh, the best legal and policy infrastructure for robotics and artificial intelligence, right? As this technology moves into the mainstream faster than even any of us, I think, would have imagined, and as we begin to literally write rules about robots, and, there, and it's, it's happening so fast that even a person like myself, which is my full-time job to keep track of this, I can't keep track of it, you know? Um, and it's just incredible. I mean, between, I mean, just in the last, like, few days, uh, there was um, uh, a situation where uh, the Department of Justice uh, brought an antitrust case against people who were using algorithms in order to do price fixing on Amazon Marketplace, right? And this is like two days ago. And then just today, or, or, or yesterday, I think it was, um, the uh, state of, of Washington uh, banned algorithms for a particular use in politics. I mean, it's, it's amazing how fast these things are really unfolding, right? And so um, I hope that over the next couple of days, um, you think a little bit not only about the question of, uh, of the, uh, at, at the moment, you know, the actual paper you're engaging with, the actual ideas, but also about the evolution of this whole, of this whole ecosystem. Um, I, I do, I of course do so at the end as well, but I do want to take a moment to thank a couple people um, uh, and, and, and entities here at the outset before we get started. Um, and uh, you know, I'll start with our, with our amazing uh, sponsors. Um, and so we, uh, this is Michael's idea too, but we group them into actuators, processors, and sensors. Um, I'm not sure if that really reflects the, uh, the actual um, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of robotics, but, uh, but you know, the actuators make, make this kind of thing possible. Intellectual Ventures, um, which is of course uh, our, our neighbor here uh, in Seattle, has been extraordinarily generous and, and we really appreciate uh, the support of that, of that company. Um, they're, they're very interested in this space, uh, increasingly so, um, and, uh, and we're very delighted to have them sponsor this conference. Um, uh, Littler Mendelssohn um, uh, is the largest labor law firm um, in, I think, in the world, and uh, it has its own robotics practice group, and it is not at all unique in that. Um, uh, Morrison and Forrester has a robotics practice group, uh, a number of different, a number, there's even boutique firms that are starting to grow up around drones and and other kinds of things. Um, Wilmer Hale, uh, another law firm, hosted, has now for the, intro, is it the second time or the third time? Second time, hosted the Robot Block Party in, uh, in Palo Alto that Andra organizes. And, um, and I mean, well over a thousand people uh, came through a law firm in order to see robots, right? And so you see this sort of interesting thing and we're tremendously grateful for that. Um, we're tremendously grateful to the Rock Center for Corporate Governance uh, now having sponsored two years uh, of this conference, or is it three, Dan? I'm not sure. But three. Sorry, my apologies. I shorted you there. Um, but thank you very much to Dan Siciliano um, uh, and to the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. Um, they are, of course, interested in boardroom issues, but robotics and artificial intelligence are increasingly a boardroom uh, issue. Um, and they're, they're interested in, in all manner of corporate governance. Um, and then, of course, uh, thank you uh, so much uh, to, to the Center for Democracy and Technology, to Google, to Microsoft, 
Uh, and again, this is co-hosted by the Center for Advanced Study and Research on Intellectual po uh, Property, CASRIP. Um, you know, Microsoft's uh, contribution, they've, they've, been, they've been contributing to this conference since the beginning, and I think it's probably not accurately represented there, because in addition to Microsoft having uh, given us, you know, uh, support of this, this conference, they support the lab that is co-hosting it, and in that way have a very, a very direct way uh, uh, made this, this conference possible. Um, so, a couple more things, and then I want to turn it over, of course, to the content here, uh, the substance. Um, my program committee, which uh, I hope you get to know over the course of, um, of the uh, uh, next couple days, um, have just been, of course, fabulous in helping to select um, the papers and all other aspects of, of planning. Um, and uh, we'll have a chance to chat with, uh, with Michael Frumkin at the end of the conference as well. And so I'm very, very grateful to, to you uh, each. Um, I'm very grateful to the support uh, staff here at the law school, uh, Hannah Kenny and her team. They've done a fabulous, fabulous job and just worked tirelessly. Um, I'm very grateful to our student volunteers, who you can't miss, because they're all wearing this awesome t-shirt that Elena Ponti designed. Where, where's Elena? I don't even know where you are right there. Thank you for doing that. It's such a cool t-shirt. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> um, our, our cartoonist um, extraordinaire and, and, and future uh, uh, robotics cartoonist, uh, I think. Um, uh, but, but also, of course, a, a, a law student. Um, Elena Ponti, thanks for that. Uh, but our volunteers have just been fabulous and, and tireless, and I appreciate that. Um, and then, last, but uh, certainly not least, um, I just want to thank Emily McReynolds, who ha is our program director at the lab. Please, please, a round of applause for Emily. Um, it, it, it would take me two days to describe all the things that Emily has done, and, I, and, I, and as much as interesting as that would be, probably, I think we were going to talk about robot law instead. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, you know, with that, I just want to say I'm, I'm delighted to see you. Um, I know this is going to be a, a really interesting, um, uh, I, I know from talking to people that there's going to be a lot of really interesting traffic in, in and out. You know, people are coming to some sessions, not others, and influx and so forth, but really do get to know each other. You'll find that there's enormous diversity of experience and expertise and training um, and so forth. And so, um, oh, and, and one last thing. I do, of course, want to thank not only uh, uh, the, the speakers and, and, and the discussants who are going to be doing a lot of the hard work and the moderators and so forth, but the many of you who have traveled from all kinds of different places in order to be here, including internationally. Um, I'm, delighted to, I'm delighted to see you. Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to transition over to our first paper of the day, um, and that's the paper by Kate Darling. Uh, many of you know Kate. She is a... Uh, quadruple alum now of, uh, of We Robot, and is really, really one of the top people thinking about the um, social dimensions of robotics and its interplay um, with the law. Um, and, uh, but to present her paper in dialogue with her um, is uh, Ken Goldberg, who I met a few years ago uh, at the Aspen Ideas Festival. And Ken is a roboticist at Berkeley, but also an artist uh, and filmmaker. Um, and has explored uh, robotics from a number of different, very interesting uh, perspectives. And so I'm really delighted to be able to, to welcome them both up here. So if you guys could come up here and get, get you set up. Um, I'm going to uh, transition over to another laptop. Um, maybe while you're doing that, um, I'll ask a couple questions. So can you guys raise your hand if you're either in, in legal training right now or have legal training? Can you, can you raise your hand if that's the case? That, that's, I, that's kind of what I would have expected, although this is actually the, so, so, so then everybody who's been in, in engineering, like computer science and engineering, electrical engineering, folks like that, that's your training. Wow. Would you like the journalists to put red dots on their heads? Uh, that, that, that's always I require journalists to wear, to wear a special uh, <laughs> a bell. Uh, uh, bell, <laughs> bell so we know they're coming and so forth. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we, have, we do, I was just say we, we have a few uh, a great journalists in, in, the, in the audience, and so I hope that you will answer the questions and also realize that they are documenting uh, what, what we're doing um, uh, as ever. So, and then what other things too, like people like our uh, human-robot interaction, psychology, social sciences, ethics, yeah, great. I mean, there's the, the philosophy, I know some people, and yeah, exactly. Can we see the philosophers one more time? Sorry. A bunch of you, yeah. 
<laughs> I think Peter, I, I'm sorry if I raised his name to every single one of us, but... Uh, <laughs> well, great. Well, this is, this is really reflective of the kind of conversation we have, and I think this is probably the most even distribution of disciplines that even that we've seen, we've seen yet. What's that? Everyone would appreciate that. If I use the microphone, yeah. So I teach in this class, so I just assume. Um, but good. All right, well, that was, uh, that's really... <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so yeah, so without, without further ado, um, I will turn it over to Ken. Thank you so much for being able to do this, and thanks to you. Okay, great. Thank, thank great. you, Ryan. All right, he deserves a round of applause for me. <laughs> Conceiving and working on this and making it happen again this year. I, I, as you mentioned, there's been, this has been the big year for robotics. It's been in the news. It's, uh, it's, it, the, the topic is very, very much in the cultural moment. In fact, this morning, many of you probably read in the New York Times a big review of the new film, Deus Ex Machina. And this is closely following on the film Her, which came out last year, I guess. And this idea that, uh, that robots are just on the, on the verge of becoming essentially human-like. Um, anthropomorphic or androids are around the corner. One of the things that's interesting to me is that the, the, there was another article that came out recently about what was described as Moore's curse. And this refers to Moore's law, which is that there's been enormous, such enormous progress in computing over the past 20 years, the, 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 this exponential you know, increase in computing power, that it's led, unfortunately, the curse part of it is that it's led to expectations in the public that everything is like this, that technology is on an exponential uh, ramp, and that essentially what we see in science fiction will soon be a reality. And in fact, this is, this is complicated by the fact that uh, some technologists are also promoting this idea, um, this idea of, of exponential growth, which I, I think is, is very deceptive and problematic because technology is really a sigmoidal process. It, 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 there's a period of very fast evolution and then it's usually followed by a plateauing. And that is, um, if you look at history of technologies um, across many different technologies, that's mo that is really the dominant case. Moore's Law, in the far, we have seen a very prolonged um, center section of the, sim of the sigmoid, but it's, um, it is also starting to show signs of plateauing now. So from technologists' point of view, it's a concern because the reality is we're lacking quite far behind the science fiction that's actually been around for quite a long time. In fact, the science fiction that we think of as deus ex machina is really a replay of um, Pygmalion, a story that goes back to um, the Greeks. And it's, it, it, it is this idea, and it's very complex and layered because it's also it's emotional, it's, it's, it has to do with gender roles. Um, these androids are often women and there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of subtle nuances that we can, we can discuss today. The particular phenomenon I want to also touch on is um, this, this particular word, the singularity, which has also been highly publicized and um, created quite a bit of, uh, of attention in the last few months. As you know, um, Stephen Hawking, uh, uh, Elon Musk, uh, our, the namesake of our building here, Bill Gates, have all announced basic concerns about, the, about the, the potential of the singularity. And for those who have been living in a cave, the idea is that we're, when, when robots and machines become sufficiently intelligent that they can start designing other machines, we'll reach a, this, this inflection point, this um, event horizon, where suddenly they'll take off and start replicating and basically designing smarter machines, which will design smarter machines until the point where um, very quickly this will eclipse human, um, humans and will be basically uh, unnecessary. And then the question is, well, will they treat us? Yes. And what the, the big, uh, and this is, this is being taken very seriously by, by, by scholars and the, the, the new book, um, Super Intelligent, Super Intelligence is, makes a very, you know, elaborate debate, or an argument about this. And um, the, the thing that I feel is that, unfortunately, from the technologist's point of view, is that this is, we're very far away 
from this kind of um, reality, that this is, this is ultimately a distraction. And it's actually taking us away from things we should be thinking about. So I want to propose, and in, instead of this, the, um, the multiplicity. And the idea of the multiplicity is that, that rather than singularity, what we should be thinking about is the idea of many machines working together with many humans, that that is far more powerful. And it actually, if you think about it, is exactly what's the, the reason behind Google's success with the search engine. It, it's, it's very complex algorithms on multiple platforms, distributed systems, but also making use of the input of human intelligence. And humans are constantly feeding into that system. What's very important in the system to make that work is diversity, both in terms of the human input, which we, we take for granted, but also in terms of the, of, the, of the machines and the algorithms. So there have been major results in the field of, of ensemble learning that show that a sufficiently diverse group of machines will always perform better than a single machine. And that idea, I think, is very powerful and is very important for us to study. The idea of multiple machines and machine learning has been studied, is being studied. And to some degree, the idea of, of, of groups of humans and their social dynamics for creativity is being studied, for example, with the recent results on um, collective intelligence. But putting those together, how do we have groups of diverse humans working with groups of diverse machines? I think that is a new area for research. And it's going to be one thing, and I'll, I'll just give you a, um, this hasn't been announced publicly, and, I, and please keep this under wraps for now, but in um, a couple of weeks, Berkeley and several other um, UC campuses will announce a new program that um, we're titling People and Robots, um, which will be an initiative that will be specifically designed to look at these questions of not only single um, robots or single humans, but the interaction of groups of, of robots and and people. All right, so with that, I, um, th that leads to an area, a sub-area that we call cloud robotics. And this is a, um, this is the idea of having lots of robots um, interacting with each other and with people over the cloud. And this was, the, the term was coined by James Kuffner, who's at Google. And I bring this up in this context because he, the, he, uh, Google was, was awarded a patent exactly 10 days ago for uh, a, a resulting approach to cloud robotics. And the, this became very, very widely known when um, Kate Darling published a response to the, um, to the patent yesterday, I think, in uh, the IEEE Spectrum yeah. online. And <clears throat> she has very thoughtful analysis of, the, of this patent and what it means, the idea of Google trying to um, basically obtain intellectual property and um, um, basically create a, a, a minefield around, of intellectual property around this topic, which has enormous implications. So it's, it's a perfect timing because we have her here today and she thinks very deeply about these topics. That's, by the way, that's not what my paper is about, but I wrote that article in about the same time I wrote the paper, so I'm happy to talk about either. Good. Well, I think they interact because one of the things that, um, that this concern, this bigger concern is about how machines will treat us in the future. And in the meantime, in the near term, what's extremely important is how we will treat machines. And this is the topic of Kate's paper today, and the... The, it's, a, it's a fascinating paper because it builds on a, a, interest, a fascinating body of work that's been um, evolved over the, last, over the last decade. And the idea of the android fallacy is one that really originated here, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Okay, no, these are not androids, I'm sorry. This is uh, <laughs> Bill Smart, Neil Richards. Um, oh, this is a roboticist and a legal scholar. Can you tell which is which? <laughs> 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 um, so I'll let Kate actually elaborate on, 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 the, on the fallacy, but the idea is a concern that um, if robots are too, if we start treating them as too human-like, um, there could be negative consequences and that we should be careful about this. She has, she in a sense wants to challenge that, um, that, that, that 
concern or the idea that it is a fallacy, that there may be times when we do want robots, we do want humans to treat robots in a human-like way or in a compassionate way. And so she has explored this in the context of um, experimental psychology. And the m most of you are familiar with some of these experiments that have gone back over the decades, back to, really it goes back to um, Cliff Nass's work on the media equation, the idea that people often anthropomorphize computers or any kinds of other kinds of machines. But a number of people have looked at this in the context of robotics, and there have been these experiments where um, the, the Bart, Bartnek and others have done things where um, they, the people were asked to strike a robot and they would do it less if the robot was exhibiting intelligent behavior. There's a paper by Rick um, where people were shown videos of robots in different um, contexts and asked how, scared, how sorry they felt for the robots or whether, which robots they would prefer to save if there were a fire uh, or an earthquake. And then it was a really very, very influential study that came out in the 2012 um, by Rose, Rosenthal von der Putin um, from Germany, who studied, did an experiment with the Plio, where the Plio was um, essentially tortured um, and videos were shown to people. Um, Plio, if you don't know, is a little, very friendly, cute uh, dinosaur robot. And so some videos were them being very nice to the robot, others where they were starting to slap the robot, and others where they were doing quite um, diabolical, torturing types of um, actions on the robot. And then they, they, they tried to, they measured the responses, how people felt. And it was fascinating that people did feel a strong um, um, empathetic reaction to the robots and to this treatment of robots. And so Kate's interest in is to take this several steps further. And um, I'm putting up this slide, the, the empathy test, because it's very interesting that um, the, the, the first step here to, to study empathy is to develop a baseline and to look at um, what is the natural empathy of the, of, of the human subjects. And so what I, I didn't know about before was that there is a, a well-known interpersonal reactivity index it's, a it's an empathy test, essentially developed by um, Davis in 1983. Um, in fact, there's, when I went online, I found that there's dozens of empathy tests out there. Um, so the, this is not limited to science fiction by any means. The, so you can measure the empathy of humans toward other humans um, by doing a series of a quiz, basically, of um, um, a, a, a survey that's scored. And then what she does is she, she takes that and then performs an experiment. And the, the way I understand it, and we'll ask her some more questions about this, is that um, rather than watching a video, it's, she makes use of uh, physical interaction. The human is given a, a hammer or mallet. And then um, the robot in this case is not anthropomorphic, but, um, but a bug. It's, um, form of a very small, let's see, yeah, hex bug. These are commercially available, but they're little uh, creatures. And <clears throat> their, her idea is then um, to ask the subject to smash the bug with the hammer or mallet. And this, um, this idea is quite, you know, somewhat violent. Um, people, some people hesitate, some people um, enjoy it with relish. Um, proceed with relish, I, and there's, there's a, a range. And so, but then what she does is she starts to study the, um, the nuances here where the, in some cases the, there is a, a framing around the bug um, where she tells, she explains to the subject that the bug is somehow friendly, may have a name, and um, this is where it, gets, it starts to get interesting because if you say, this is Frank, he's lived at the lab for a few months now, he likes to play, etc., setting up this framing, this sort of narrative, then she asks him to smash the bug. There's a noticeable delay. There's a hesitation. And she's, she's explored a number of different framing narratives and how they influence this delay and this, these responses. So this, this is the, the subject of the, uh, the, the experiments. And... We're, I'm going to ask her to, to say a few words. She has some of the data here that we'll, we'll, she'll share with us. And then the paper 
moves to the, the results. And what is the implications of this, which is specifically what we're concerned with here at this conference. And it has to do, I think, with the, the effects of, um, you know, it's trying to understand this from, from one perspective is design. How does this kind of, these results influence our thinking about design, which I feel is very related to the uncanny valley. The, the sense of wanting robots to be just anthropomorphic enough or somehow in some sense get that sweet spot if we want to, there to be a positive relationship. She also raises the very interesting question where we actually want to um, avoid that kind of compassion. So there's a nice story of, um, which I hope she'll elaborate on, where the um, robots in military um, contexts, the soldiers are empathi empathized with them but these robots are, for example, do, doing demining. And so there is a potential that, um, and apparently this has been reported, that, the, that, that humans will actually put themselves at risk to protect the robots because they feel in some way a compassion and gratefulness to, the, to this demining robot because it saved many lives of their peers. They're now willing to re return the favor, as it were, and protect the robot. This obviously is not what we want. So how, how can you design such a robot system to avoid that kind of identification and compassion because it could have a negative consequence. And the paper is filled with these kind of examples and, um, and really interesting issues that come up. There's, there's also one that, that I'm also very, I've been very interested in over the years is, is has to do with privacy in this context. And what are the issues of Privacy, for example, the Jibo robot, which has just come out, or it's actually not on the market yet, I don't believe, uh, but, it, but it has been in the news quite a bit. This is the robot that will sit on your counter and basically can move around. It's just basically a, a, a screen, but it's on a motorized platform, and it can be used as a, essentially a companion that would, um, you can ask it to send reminders. Um, it also takes pictures. If you've seen the video, it's actually quite interesting and compelling and raises some of these privacy questions because the idea is it's always on, it's kind of looking around, and the question is, well, what is it recording and who has access to the images and data that it's capturing? And then the last thing she, that, there's, that I want to bring up in, is, the, um, is one line in here that really caught my eye that I hadn't ever um, considered before. And it has to do, this really tr connects with something else that's going on in the news now, which is the, um, a lot of the, the, the awareness that's been raised about um, solitary confinement and prisons in this country. There's been a New York Times series of articles, and it's, uh, it's, an, it's an extremely alarming and upsetting um, phenomenon and is far more common than, um, than I think most of us realize. And the, um, the question is... In, in Kate raises is could a robot be used in any sense in this context um, in some sense of prison rehabilitation or to as a con to console or in some way offer some comfort to someone in that context um, essentially the locked into a into a small cell um, with no um, uh, human um, companionship or interaction um, is, is, is a, sort of the worst form of torture imaginable. And c what would that be like if, um, if a robot could be introduced? As, um, in what role could that possibly play? And I, that, that's, um, I think, opens up all kinds of interesting challenges and ethical questions and um, psychological and even philosophical questions about what, what a robot could, could do in that context. I think that's also something I hope we'll be able to talk about this morning. So with that, let me um, turn the floor over to, to Kate to say a few words about the, the, the experiments themselves. Fair? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, thank you so much, Ken. Um, yeah, wow, it's always interesting when someone else has read your paper and is talking about the, the aspects that, that caught their eye. It's sometimes surprising, you know, what, what they took away from it. Um, and this is also very much a work in progress I'm, I'm still workshopping it, um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to everyone's questions and comments. Um, but just to kind of elaborate on two of the things that you brought up, the first is framing, 
And the second is, I, I want to talk a little bit about the empathy um, questions. You should stay up here. We should have a conversation. <laughs> and by the way, um, using the hashtag WeRobot uh, on Twitter, if anyone is interested in doing that. Hashtag WeRobot. <laughs> okay. So, oh, cool. Um, so, so basically, um, the the idea behind this paper. It, it ties into a conversation that we've had at a bunch of previous We Robots. So those of you who have, who have been here um, know that a, a prominent theme has been anthropomorphism and anthropomorphism in the context of robots and whether it's a desirable thing to anthropomorph anthropomorphize robots or an undesirable thing for people to do so and whether we should encourage or discourage it. And it's been very much a yes or no discussion so far. And what this paper tries to do is say, it depends. It really depends on the use of the technology. It depends on whether anthropomorphism is going to enhance what the technology is trying to do, such as in the case of social robots and therapeutic robots and that sort of thing, or whether it's going to actually be a hindrance to the technology, such as in the case of these military robots which um, many people, not myself, have studied, Julie Carpenter and others, uh, where it's really, it can be anything from inefficient to dangerous to have people anthropomorphizing these tools that they're supposed to be working with. And the paper tries to, um, or suggests that framing might be a tool that we can use to really make this distinction. And um, so what do I mean by framing? Well, so <laughs> Neil and Bill, who are on the slides, and I, I wish Neil were here, but Bill is, um, they, they had a paper in the first We Robot conference called How Should the Law Think About Robots? And what I mean by framing the paper generally is very much what they meant in that paper, which is, you know, how, what, what metaphors are we using and what ways are we using to think about robots that drive the design of technology, the use of technology, and ultimately the regulation of technology and how we relate to it. Um, and a lot of, so currently, a, a lot of times robotic technology is framed very anthropomorphically and that's because, and they go into this as well, that's because we are so primed by science fiction and pop culture and all the things that you mentioned to think about robots in this way because in science fiction they're often portrayed as very personified or they're portrayed as um, you know, having, having experiences that are lifelike. And um, so we, we tried to use this type of narrative in, in our experiment that we did uh, we had people come in, we introduced them to this hex bug, and in some cases we gave them a story to read that was very personified. You know, this is Frank. Frank's favorite color is red. Frank likes to play. And then we had other narratives, we had another narrative where it was more based on this um, having experiences and changing through experiences. Um, and we found that people responded really strongly to both of those narratives in hesitating to strike the robot, as Ken mentioned. And um, so that's, that's what I mean by framing generally. I don't know, we can talk more about that. As for the empathy part, I'm, I'm really, really excited about the empathy part of this study. I think it's super interesting that we were really able to establish that people <laughs> who have low empathic concern for others, they, they really don't care about the bugs. They'll just smash them no matter whether their name is Frank or <laughs> whatever. But people who have high empathic concern responded very strongly to this storytelling aspect. And that's really cool in part also because, and these aren't, these aren't comparable experiments in, in every aspect, but the one you mentioned with the Plio videos, they did the same type of empathy testing, but they found a correlation with fantasy empathy, which is a different type. It's whether you can relate to characters in movies and books and that type of thing. And so we were really excited to, we were expecting to find that, but we were excited to find that no, people are genuinely 
empathically concerned about these robots, or at least that's what our results indicate. Um, and, and like you mentioned, the voigt kampf test, I think it's funny that you picked the exact same picture that I've also used in presentations <laughs> about it. So uh, how many of you have seen Blade Runner or read the book, Do Android Stream of Electric? Wow, this is an amazing room. <laughs> The, to the like two people who haven't, please do so. It's an amazing book, amazing movie as well. Um, but there's this test in it that you mentioned where you know they they can tell the so the robots have become so like humans that it's really hard to tell them apart. And so they have this test where they use storytelling and narrative to assess whether you are empathic or not. And so what we've done is the reverse. And so instead of testing robots, we're testing humans, and we can basically say whether you are an empathic human or not based on how you respond to storytelling around robots. So that's kind of cool. Um, but the, the more interesting question that we don't get at in the experiment, but which I'm really interested in and ties into this prison question, is not whether we can measure people's empathy with robots, but whether we can change people's empathy with robots. So for instance, whether it would desensitize someone if they were you know, being brutal towards robots and kind of abusing them repeatedly. I don't know if you guys, have you guys seen the Boston Dynamics video where they're introducing their new robot called Spot? I, wish, I don't know if we can. No, okay, so I'll just describe it. It's, it's a robot that looks very dog-like and it's meant for military purposes. It's not supposed to be you know, a dog, but they named it Spot. And it walks around in the video and it gets kicked twice because they're demonstrating the stability of the robot. But it's on all four legs and when it gets kicked, it visibly you know, struggles to stay on all four legs. And when this got released, people had very negative responses to it and you know anything from jokingly upset to actually upset that this dog-like thing is being kicked in the video and to the extent where the animal rights organization PETA you know had to make a press statement and acknowledge the incident. Is that true? Yeah well so they were getting calls and they so th their press statement ended up being you know we're not going to lose any sleep over this because it's a robot but, but they said it makes sense that people would find this type of behavior um, inappropriate. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so, so you know, the, the question that I think is most interesting is, you know, is the guy whose job it is to kick this robot like seven, seven times a day, would he be more likely to kick a real dog? And to put a more positive spin on it, you know, if that's true, then we might also be able to use robots in the same way that we would like to be able to use animal therapy in a lot of cases, but can't because animals are expensive and they come with allergies and hygiene problems and all sorts of things. And so one of these areas would be, for instance, in prisons. If you could actually make people more compassionate or use robots in a therapeutic way to give people a sense of purpose, the way that they're used in nursing homes now, or beginning to be used, and give, make people you know, develop a sense of caring by caring for something, even though they know that it's not alive, that would be a really, really interesting use of robots. And that's, that's a question that I'm interested in exploring, although it's very, very difficult to actually test. Definitely. Is that a good time for us to open up for some Sure. Yeah, this is supposed to be a participatory, so people okay. go through Thank you, Kate. Perfect. Do we need to use mics if possible because we're trying to let them come I mean, I'll go if nobody else is. Um, uh, should we do the thing where we identify ourselves in the microphone? Yes. Um, so <laughs> Who are you? Woody. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you? Um, Woodrow Hartzog, Stanford University's Cumberland School of Law. Really great paper, Kate. I, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, and I had, uh, I had three kind of comments or, or questions. Um, one is with respect to your methodology. 
Um, one of the things I wondered is if you had considered using a non-robot and framing it to see if you had similar effects for, for non-robots, um, to see whether that might suss out a little more about the actual impact of framing. Um, uh, and then another question, a question that I had was, can you hypothesize as to how much of this, um, to, to put my Daniel Kahneman hat on, is system one versus system two? So the idea that some of our reactions and our, 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 our the way that we respond to things are kind of, we don't deliberate over them, it's just kind of embedded, right? this automatic system where we, we viscerally feel something. And then some of our reactions we, we kind of come to because we contemplate them, right? And so framing strikes me as a really interesting it could fall on either one, right? The idea that, well, I've contemplated this robot's backstory, and so um, now I'm concerned about it, right? Or is it, is, it, is it much more kind of embedded? And the reason I ask is it's important to know because if we do want to engage in some kind of deep bias in here, this is indeed a bias that we find, it matters whether it's system one or system two um, within the common words. Um, and then, um, and, and actually, I'll leave it. I'll talk to you about the other There's stuff. There's two comments. Yeah, okay. Two, two um, so the first one has to do with non-robots, and I actually, the, I'm glad you asked that, Woody. Um, the analogy I was thinking of was like, well, you could use a watch, right? Right, and you could say, would you smash the watch? So what we did, and I should say, like the experiment is a separate paper that is going to, which I did with uh, my research partner Palash Nandi, and under the supervision of Cynthia Brazil. So that's. And it's not online yet because we're still working on it, but it will be soon. Um, so it's, but it's a separate paper. But I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. So, um, what we did, we ha we actually had a bunch of different conditions, and we had a bunch of conditions where the robot is moving and not moving. So the idea being that when it's not moving, it's an object, and when it's moving, it's a robot. Um, we are still working on that, however, because we got very mixed results in the movement conditions. And that's probably because we used a robot that, man, I wish, I, I'll show, I have these things in my purse, so you need to approach me and I will show you how they move. But they move very bug-like and a lot of people, a lot of our participants in the surveys related them to cockroaches, which not everyone is a fan of. <laughs> so while they move in a very lifelike way, it's not a way that everyone likes. And so we got, we have to, you know, disentangle what was going on in the movement conditions. And so we can't make a statement yet as to you know, what, the, what the relative effects of movement and storytelling are. I mean, we see that storytelling has a strong effect. What, what the movement thing does, we're still, like we have to do a few more rounds. Um, and and you know, we're planning on doing much more of these studies to disentangle that. Uh, for the second one, the, that's a really interesting question about, you know, how much of this is a visceral response, like this biological hardwiredness to respond to something um, versus an intellectual uh, kind of response. And um, I think that's really important. And the paper acknowledges that a large piece of why we anthropomorphize robots has to do with physical motion. And this, and that's, you know, widely regarded as why we have this visceral response to robots and, and treat them subconsciously like lifelike things. And um, the, so the, the problem with, with that is that robots have to move, usually. And um, even in the case of military robots, uh, one of the reasons that a lot of them are structured like animals right now isn't because, you know, that's cool and we want to anthropomorphize them, but rather because animals have evolved through so many years of evolution to actually be really practical for moving around difficult terrain. And so just for reasons of practicality, it's much harder to influence the movement part of robots. But if framing has even a little bit of an impact, you know, that is definitely something that we are more able to influence. Um, that's, is that, yeah. Uh, my, mine follows on Woody's point. Uh, this is Ryan uh, Kilo, University of Washington. So, um, a couple, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so, a couple things, I mean, number one is, uh, I found to be, so Kahneman, Kahneman's fast and slow, right? Um, 
and that's a great that's a great framework um, and, and and very helpful. I, I also think that Josh Green's work out of Harvard, he's a Harvard psychologist, where he talks about the fact that there is um, an emotional component and a rational component, and that you can manipulate them, and so you can up the rational or down, and 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 so what he does is a lot of trolley problem stuff, um, and uh, and so. He shows that if you can prime people to be more emotional in their in their sort of focus, you can change whether or not people are willing to push somebody off to say about to the utilitarian calculus. You know, and so that might also be an interesting frame. And then I wish that he were the volunteer that actually were not out of the room. But one of my students named Sam Sudar, who's a um, uh, computer science uh, PhD candidate here, wrote this great paper for me in, in uh, my robotics law and policy course about. Um, and we've talked about this too, uh, Kate, uh, about uh, functional equivalence and how when you substitute an animal for a, for a, right for a um, uh, when you substitute an animal for a robot or a robot for an animal, it it suddenly completely changes the legal view, right? Like the Federal Aviation Administration has nothing to say about delivering, you know, goods with pigeons. You know what I mean? And and if uh, if we could get people to see Google Glass as uh, being akin to a seeing eye dog. There's no way that a bar could ban it. And I wondered whether, um, now that the, the Josh Green's have just a suggestion to look at it if you haven't, but I wonder if you could react to the idea of, of functional equivalence uh, since it's certainly a lot of your paper. Yeah, well, I mean, bringing it back to the original paper that inspired all this by Bill and Neil, um, they argue that the law needs to you know, strictly regard robots as tools and not animals, not companions, nothing of that sort, but strictly as hammers as they, as they use. Um, and what I argue is that, you know, if we're going to make this distinction between anthropomorphized technology and non-anthropomorphized technology and really push that through, um, that, that really leads us to <laughs> maybe legal solutions that recognize that we are viewing some robots not just as things and tools, but rather as you know, social agents in a way, or moral patients. And um, I, yeah, I, so in the paper I, I go into this a little bit more, but I think that if people are consistently treating robots more as agents than things, then maybe the law should actually recognize that. And I don't, so that, that does tie a little bit into functional equivalence, although it's more about, you know, I guess people's relationship to the, uh, did you want to follow up? I just want to follow up. So, so Jack Balkin, in, in, in criticizing uh, my work, uh, Jack is a law professor at, at Yale, um, said uh, that actually what we're talking about here is substitution. And it's the idea of substituting, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not just the fact that machines have a social dimension to them, which they do, and, I, and you and I think you know, that, that that's meaningful and, and has all kinds of repercussions. But Jack says, actually, what, what's going on here is there's a substitution. And it gets to Ken's ideas about the uncanny. Right? The idea is that we're taking what would be a person and we're substituting in it. And whenever you substitute, it's not perfect substitution. It's different. How does the law recalibrate to that substitution? And, and Jack's comment has got me thinking about that. Um, and thinking also not just about substituting people, but also substituting animals. Yes. Because we have developed areas of animal. And that's, that's where I'm doing a driver. Yeah, I'm all about the animal substitution, as you know. I mean, that's, I feel like we have a framework to, to think about robots as companions without needing to go into questions of, well, but robots aren't smart enough to be companions. But if we look at our relationship to animals, and in the law, we're, we're protecting animals from abuse, but we're not protecting them from being killed and eaten, for instance, uh, you know, we already have a framework to think about this kind of new relationship that we could have with, with robots. Uh, I'm David Post at the uh, Open Technology Institute uh, in Washington. Um, so I have a question about, I'm, I'm disturbed hey, um, by the, the use of the term what's going on in, in these experiments. Um, because in my very non-technical understanding of what empathy is, um, is that I am putting myself, I'm trying to put myself, or I'm really put, because of some psychological reaction, into the subject. I'm, I'm, I'm 
experiencing what the subject experiences, if I'm empathetic um, to someone who's undergoing suffering, I, I am suffering with them. Um, but these bugs are not suffering. Um, I think we can take that as a, as a given that there is no actual suffering going on when, when I take the hammer and pound them. So whatever, I, I may be reluctant to do that for some strange reasons that people are reluctant to do that. More reluctant if you give them a story about it's Frank and he lives here and he's so adorable. Um, but whatever that is, it strikes me as that's sort of not empathy. It needs another name because that confuses it with the situation in which there actually is a sentient being on the, as the subject and I am entering, entering into that uh, uh, sentient being's consciousness. And it led me to the second sub-question, which is, if you point that out to people, does it change their reactions in subsequent experiments? Because if you just, after this experiment is done and they hear the story and they smash the bug or they don't smash the bug, if you, it's another experiment, um, if you then stop and it's, you, know, you open up the bug or you just point out to them that they are having this peculiar irrational reaction of pseudo empathy for something that is not in fact a sentient being and it's just a toy and uh, you know, we, we fabricated it here last night. Um, and will they react differently in subsequent experiments? Which is related to the question, is this all about our just, we're unfamiliar with these things now, but as we learn that these are just, you know, when it's just a toaster, um, that over time this sort of pseudo-empathy will, will, will kind of disappear. Yeah, that's a really, really great, great uh, point. So, the interesting thing about the previous studies that have been done uh, around robot torture and abuse is that uh, no one has really been able to dis disentangle you know, various reasons why people might be reluctant to abuse a robot or why they might feel you know, badly about it. Uh, for instance, in workshops that I've done where we have people smash Pleos, it's really hard to tell whether people are reluctant to smash it because it costs $500 or because, you know, they are actually <laughs> worried about its, uh, about the Clio itself as a, a being. Um, but this is why we did the psychological trait empathy testing in our experiment. And it's not a test I made up. It's, it's like the gold standard in psychology for, for trait empathy. And it measures um, a few different types of empathy as well. And so like I mentioned, I, I found it really interesting. I mean, you can say that you don't believe this, but we did find a strong correlation with genuine empathic concern for others. Now you can, I mean, you can say, well, it's pseudo empathy, but it, it, on the scale, it is rating the same as people who have empathic concern for other humans. That is what, that is, it, it, our results indicate that that is what is going on with these robots. Uh, I, I think it's interesting. I think it's also interesting you bring up the excellent point, well, um, is this just because people, this is new, people aren't used to this technology, you know, when, when telephones got invented, people probably freaked out about the voice coming out of the phone. Is this just a matter of time until we get used to it? And that is certainly a possibility that, you know, I'm, I'm willing to admit. But a lot of us feel that it might be a little bit deeper than that. And there's some evidence, for instance, if you look at roboticists who build social robots like Cynthia Brazil and others, they are not immune to this effect of anthropomorphizing the own, their own robots that they have built. They know exactly how they work and yet they become emotionally attached to them and they respond the same way that others do as well. So we think that this might be a little bit more deep-seated and we think that we might be biologically hardwired to respond especially to the physical motion part of this. So I don't think it's going away, but you, I might be proven wrong. Can I just say on the first point, the empathy point, just 
to, a, to, to consider the difference between saying this mimics empathy in some strange way. And, and in fact, it's amazing that it does. I'm not denying the, the, the fascinating result. It's different to say this mimics empathy from saying it is empathy. But do you have any ideas for how we could test, you know, beyond using the gold standard in psychology for testing empathy, for how we could prove that it's mimicking or not mimicking? No, I, I think you have shown that it mimics through the use of the test. I'll give you that. It seems to astonishingly mimic the reactions that people have that are truly empathetic responses. That's fascinating and a great result, but that's, a, that's I, I think, significantly different sort of definitionally and philosophically from saying it is an empathic. Well, one thing, and how much time do we have left, Ryan? Oh, good. Okay. So I think this is great. This is really interesting. I mean, to my mind, the, her choice specifically of the bug is fascinating here because to what degree do we have empathy with cockroach? I mean, it is, and, and there, for example, I, I learned that cockroaches are not covered by human subjects or by animal subjects. So biologists are free to pull, do whatever they want to cockroaches. They don't need to get permission. Um, and if you think about it, though, uh, think about Kafka's uh, metamorphosis, right, where you can actually empathize with a bug in, in, under some conditions. So I think that's a really interesting variant and that she's studying that in this context, but you're right, it's much more has to be, you know, will, will be needed to be done here. Okay, so because we want to cover, to get every, to hear from everybody, we have four more questions and five or so more minutes. Let's, uh, 15, oh, I'm sorry, okay, good. So we'll, let's, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on if you don't mind, and then um, I'll try and keep things moving so that we can get to the end, good? All right, next question, please. Hi, Kate, I'm Karen Levy. I'm from NYU and Data and Society. Um, and I love the paper, I love the experiment. It reads as like this really kind of cool follow-on 50 years later to like the Milgram shock experiments. You know, that was like what kept going through my head, especially when you were talking about like the things people would say as they were doing it, like, oh, it's just a robot, it's just a robot, right? It's like very reminiscent of the accounts of that experiment where people are like gritting their teeth and like just trying to get through it. Um, so it's really, it's an inspired design. Um, and I have two quick questions for you. The first is sort of specifically about some of the frames that you use. So, you know, you mentioned that you use these two frames, this one in which the robot has a name, um, and then another in which the robot has sort of a set of experiences but is like, um, and I wanted to just like ask you to talk a little bit more about that. I saw that you didn't actually find like a statistically significant difference between the two in terms of the outcomes. But I would have expected, and I'm maybe I'm guessing that maybe you hypothesized this too, that the name would actually add sort of an additional dimension um, of personalization that maybe it didn't. So if there's stuff that's not in the paper about kind of the interactions you saw, I'd be interested to know that. And then more generally, and kind of going to Ryan's point about other areas of law that might um, inform the way we regulate in response to findings like like the one in your paper. Um, so I was just trying to think of like what are some other areas of law um, or policy in which we like actually like very much depend on people having this sort of visceral um, psychological reaction. And the only one I could think of um, was abortion law. Where, you know there are certain abortion uh, restrictions in certain states, right, which have been very controversial. Of course, where like we actually require a woman to like have an ultrasound where she views her fetus. Um, before she's permitted to like go get the abortion, right? And like, the, 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 there seems to be no real reason to do that except that like the viewing of something that's like arguably human, um, you know, it triggers some, I don't know if you'd call it empathy, but triggers some, you know, very emotional response that then maybe changes her decision making process. Um, so I'm curious if there are others, I mean, Ryan mentioned animal law, if there are other areas of law that you think um, might kind of inform the way we move forward in this area. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, I, I, so to respond to the second one first, because I don't have an answer, um, I have not thought about other areas um, of law, but the abortion one is a, is a really interesting um, case where you know, it's being used politically to get a response from people. Um, yeah, so uh, wait, so the first question was the uh, the difference between the two different narratives that, that we used. So it's interesting. We didn't, we weren't sure what direction it would go. We wanted to see if there was a difference, but you could make a case either way. You could say, okay, obviously, you know, Frank is going to be, you know, the, the highest uh, result for like hesitation and empathy and anthropomorphism because, you know, 
Frank, and Frank's favorite color is red. And, um, but on the other hand, research from design in robotics shows that sometimes less is more when it comes to anthropomorphism. So if you can build something that's, that doesn't have all of the elements, but has just enough of the elements that you will project onto it, sometimes that's even stronger. And so we weren't sure in what direction it would go, but we thought it could go either way with the, with the second narrative actually being stronger than the first. And we didn't, we, yeah, we didn't find a significant difference um, between the two narratives because I guess they were both you know, anthropomorphic enough. We did just find significant differences between having no anthropomorphic narrative and anthropomorphic narrative. Um, so thanks, great paper, great talk. Um, so I'm Peter Acero from the New School in Princeton. Um, and I was just thinking more about this question about real empathy and this sort of thing. But, but really, there's a lot more going on. But there's a lot about value. We've talked about this before, and you mentioned that just because it's a valuable object, sort of monetarily, you might not want to smash it for that reason. But I think there's actually a rich discourse in aesthetics and in art theory about valuing objects. And since we had the artist on stage also. Um, and just thinking about like Ai Weiwei, the Chinese artist who's quite famous for smashing these Chinese vases that are very old and incredibly valuable. And people have this incredibly powerful reaction to that. And, and it becomes also political. It's because of this kind of artwork. Uh, but there's also a lot in, in the writings of David Hume, where he's talking about more sentiments, where he gets into this kind of physics of how you relate to others empathetically or sympathetically, and the kind of shroud and Freud where you can actually take pleasure in the suffering of others sometimes, your adversaries or your uh, competitors. Uh, but then he also talks a lot about sort of making tables. And if you make your table, you have a much deeper emotional connection to it because you made it, you see it as an extension of yourself, even though it's a physical object, versus if you just buy a table. It's called the IKEA effect. There have been studies on this. <laughs> Right, so I'm just wondering if maybe we could discuss that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, so what we really, what we're really trying to do in this round is kind of uh, uh, really separate, as I've mentioned, the value aspect from the empathy aspect because that hadn't that hadn't been done. Um, but we did. <laughs> it's interesting that you bring up the IKEA effect because we had one idea for experiments was. Um, the hex bugs are based on this robot that you can make yourself very easily with using a toothbrush head and a little motor that vibrates and it moves the same way that the hex bug does. And so we wanted to have people make them and then give them pre-made ones and see you know, what difference that would be and see whether the IKEA effect uh, applied here. But we haven't done that yet. Um, but yes, I think that is a very interesting question as well. And thank you for... Um, the the, uh, the tips I, I wrote down, David Hume, because I have not read his work. It's a great one, and actually it relates a little bit to Woody's question, I think, at the beginning, which is about, you know, just as control, it would be interesting to have other objects that people would be, um, to, to measure their hesitation in smashing. You know, the watch, maybe it's an inexpensive watch versus an expensive watch, or a, some kind of work of art in some way, would people feel that hesitation, and to what degree? Re very interesting. Great. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Um, over here, I'm sorry. Hello. Um, okay. Um, I'm Tim Brown. I am a uh, philosophy student in, here at UW. I'm also uh, embedded in the Biorobotics Laboratory. Um, I'm doing work on uh, deep brain stimulators and neuroethical implications the use of deep, deep brain stimulators uh, for essential training. Um, so my question, um, I'll try to keep it short. Um, so whenever I hear of anybody doing tests for empathy, I think of um, uh, tests for empathy in people with aut autism spectrum disorder. Um, and so um, I guess I have two questions. Um, so first, um, how well do you think uh, the gold standard in uh, psychological analyses of uh, uh, Empathy tracks uh, people with autism's ability to latch on to people's emotional states and things like that. Um, 
I know you mentioned it in the papers, and, and this leads to my second question. Uh, you mentioned that the now next generation robot um, can serve as a, um, a liaison between uh, a child with autism and uh, their parent or guardian, uh, or other people in general. Um, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how that works, because I know if, if I understand it correctly, well, there are a lot of theories about what what's going on with autism, but the idea is that it's hard to it's hard to hone in or or track emotional states in other people. Um, and so, could you say a little bit more about that? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm not an autism expert by any means. Um, I, but so what I mentioned in the paper is that this uh, little humanoid robot called the Now Next Generation, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, they've been testing it with in education settings, and they've they've been using it with uh, autistic children, like you mentioned. And I think what they've done so far is they've re it's it's less about um, teaching the child to recognize emotions, and at this stage, more about just engaging. The child at all, because often um, it's hard, and I I don't know. I think uh, I think also it's every child is different. Every autistic child, it's not it's just one, as far as I know. But um, sometimes it's hard to engage them in whatever you need to be doing with them. And they found that the robot helps because it's this like fascinating thing that's lifelike and captures their attention and sometimes they will be more they'll be willing to talk to the robot or engage with the robot when they don't want to talk to the adult and so that can help bridge that type of communication but there's also the question of whether robots might be able to be used in contexts like that to help children develop skills um, including recognizing emotions and I know that sounds I mean people are probably like like Sherry Turkle's like ah, don't don't replace the humans um, but there's this really interesting story that was in the I think it was in the New York Times about an autistic child who had developed a relationship with Siri yeah. I don't know who read that story and at first you're like oh, this sounds bad, but then you read it and the mother actually makes a really interesting case for why it has been beneficial for her child to be interacting with Siri. Um, because he's, like, first of all, Siri has infinite patience with all of the repetitive questions that he needs answered, like, that would drive any parent crazy after four hours. Um, but also Siri has taught him to articulate his words clearly because her voice recognition sucks and to you know, to to have a conversation that follows a logical structure um, and she's noticed that he's his conversation skills have improved with her and with other children since talking to Siri more and so that's kind of cool I mean it's it's a little bit worrying because Siri isn't meant to do this or isn't specifically designed to help autistic children so there could be unintended negative effects as well but it certainly shows that you know sometimes technology when used you know in the right way by a parent can can help can help these kids and robots might be able to do that also through this social engagement effect thank you so much I have a very inspired parent who's sort of a fantastic panel. <coughs> and I'm hearing Peter's comments that this for you, Pat, it's a hard thing. Maybe you could get Gallagher to both smash a watermelon and then the next act to smash like a robotics watermelon. <laughs> 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 but I, I've got a, just a very basic uh, question for you, Kate. So here's something I spoke that was just, just kind of blew my mind listening to one of the responses, right? You pointed out when, when he was asking some of these sort of behavior economic questions, sort of set the tone for whether there's like, um, some sort of deep-seated thing in us, because you said that even the researchers themselves, no matter how well steeped you are in the literature of the effects of countering something that's anthropomorphic, it still kind of gets over you. And in the behavioral economic literature, you constantly find the researchers saying, it doesn't matter how much we know about predictable and irrationality, like, we're still subject to the same bias, right? Like, we know that if you put out the bowl of nuts, people will be like, ish, and they'll just keep eating them, and even if we know that, we're still going to eat them. So I was thinking about that, but also in the context of, so your paper is trying to break through the binary of should we have a more or shouldn't we? And you're suggesting we need a little sort of contextual 
specificity, and we need to think about these in different cases. So here's how I'm trying to put those two thoughts together. I'm hoping you can say something about it. So on the one hand, we've got to get really contextual. On the other hand, you're noticing this sort of invariant response. So I was wondering if, as a sort of heuristic, if we began to try to sort of formulate the principles for thinking about these things, if, um, if everything isn't just going to be context specific, if there's any kind of general issues that ought to guide people as they get into their context specific things, does this invariant response suggest to you any kind of general kind of recommendations with respect to either design or disclosure? Is there something that can sort of carry forward from this insight to all the different contextual bits? Excellent, excellent point. Um, I think that. <laughs> so I, I think I think for one thing, well, I want to say that um, this this uh, response that we have, this visceral response to robots, is very much. I think it's a great comparison to behavioral economics, where you know, no matter no matter whether you know that it's happening, whether you've read Nudge, you know, you still you're still susceptible to it, and it's also you know a problem in the context of you know we. D where we don't want to anthropomorphize the robots, such as in the military context. And um, I'm actually not sure, like I think framing might be able to help, but framing is never going to make this go away. People will anthropomorphize their Roombas. People will anthropomorphize a moving stick. I don't know if you saw that study. Um, so while, while I think framing and context is, is, might be helpful, and our study indicates that it could have an effect, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna completely make it go away. Now, what this means for me moving forward is basically that anyone who is claiming we should not be anthropomorphizing robots and we need to discourage it is fighting a losing battle, basically. And any anything that we do moving forward needs to take into account that we're not gonna be able to make this go away, and need we we're going to need to find ways to you know, develop a framework for dealing with robotic technology, acknowledging that this is happening. Um, and this is, this is a start at trying to come up with, you know, a, a framework to, to really distinguish between cases where, you know, there's, there's no way we're going to stop people from anthropomorphizing social robots. So let's not, let's acknowledge that. And in cases where it is a problem, you know, maybe double down on the other tools that we have. Okay, we have time for one more. Hi, uh, my name's David. I'm the master's student at Georgetown in the Communication and Cultural Technology Program. Uh, my question was, is, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you mean by framing. Uh, it seems like, I mean, a lot of people are talking about your paper, like, I think it's about these two things. So. Um, I think it's, it seems like you talk about framing and you talk about design. And these are, framing seems to do with context and use of the, of the technology and design is something that happens when it's created. But there's no really, especially if these things become consumer products and they are <coughs> achieve what it's produced, we don't really know what they're going to be used for. You can, things are often designed for a certain purpose and used for something totally different, right? And it's like if we just, at that point, it, it's like when you're, I don't know. I guess I was wondering if you just talk more about that and, and what kind of concerns those would have when pushing forward for the for some sort of framework for dealing with those problems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good point. I I used to before I went to MIT. I was I was very much of the mindset that technology gets developed by the technologists, and you know it's all special purpose technology. And once it exists and people start using it, that is when we need to start thinking about policy and regulation and use. And that is the job of like the legal scholars and the policymakers. And then when I started working more closely with roboticists, I realized that that's not, that it doesn't work that way because in the design process, you already have the you know some visions of how it's going to be used, and you are starting to set standards that later on become entrenched, and and at some point it becomes you know almost too late for policymakers to later on do anything about that. And um, Neil and Bill make the excellent point in their paper that the metaphors that we use to think about robotic technology matter, and they start mattering at the design stage where people are thinking about designing the robots. So um, 
yeah, I, I, I think that that's why, that's why framing matters at every stage and not just in the policy stage. So I, I just want to make two last, last points, and I want to thank you so much for, and, and all of you for the, for the provocative questions. The, the two last points have to do with um, the, it, it very recently there was a, um, a, a, a protest in Austin um, by a group called, called Stop the Robots. And it was actually with placards, et cetera, and they were, they were protesting. And it's created quite an interesting stir at the South by Southwest conference. Everybody was sort of, you know, the, the, the people were so up in arms about this. And then it turned out that it was actually, in, in talking about layers of framing and deception and Milgram, et cetera, here it was actually a, uh, it was a promotion for an, a startup company. It was a total prank. And everybody was hired to do this, uh, stop the robots. But in the meantime, it had created, and, and their story was that it had gotten out of control, and then all of a sudden CNN and all these comp um, press had picked it up, and then they couldn't, they couldn't confess that it wasn't real. And it's a great story. You can read about it online. The last thing I want to say is in um, regards to the, um, this idea of bugs, I think it's fascinating if, um, and the other question, film I'm curious how many of you have seen is Big Hero 6. You put your hands up. Okay, again, just like Blade Runner, if you haven't, please go out and see this. It's an amazing film, or I would say the first 30 minutes. Because, I don't like the second half for reasons, uh, I won't spoil it, but um, you might be able to tell. But, the, the, um, but it actually has bugs, robots as bugs plays a central role to it. And it's actually fascinating because it comes back to this idea of multiplicity and, and cloud robotics because it's not just a single bug. It's that when you start putting a whole swarm of them together, then, then robots, swarms of robot bugs can do an amazing things. And that's what uh, is portrayed beautifully in the film. All right, so with that, I want to thank you, Kate, for doing a great job. <laughs>